And as you turn to Jeremiah 42, uh, start in 40, Jeremiah chapter 40. <clears throat> Father, as we just sang, Lord, today, I know that you uh, have a special blessing for us. And it's because we've put our foundation on upon your solid rock. We're anchoring up, Lord, to the heavenlies where the rocks sit at the right hand of God. And Lord, our desire is that we would do things well-pleasing in your sight. Each one of us, Lord, I believe here in this room, God just wants to be a bigger part of the great things that you are doing in this world. And, and we can't understand it all, Lord, but we just, one step at a time, we want to do the faith walk. We want to do what you have in mind for us each and every day, not get in your way. I pray, God, that you would use this service um, as you have prepared my heart, Lord, you would prepare each and every one of us, Lord, to receive what you have. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Jeremiah chapter 40, this just kind of outlines the setting of what we're talking about. I want to talk about this morning, uh, this afternoon, what came to me this morning, even at about 4 a.m. Um, this sermon I've entitled, For They Were Afraid. For They Were Afraid. The setting begins, what's going on in Jeremiah chapter 42, we'll get there, in Jeremiah 40, verse 1. Jeremiah 40, verse 1. The Bible reads, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, after that Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had let him go from Ramah, when he had taken him, being bound in chains among all that were carried away captive of Jerusalem and Judah, which were carried away captive unto Babylon. And the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said unto him, The Lord thy God hath pronounced his evil upon this place. Now the Lord hath brought it, and done according as he hath said, because ye have sinned against the Lord, and have not obeyed his voice. Therefore this thing has come upon you. And now behold, I loose thee this day from the chains which were upon thine hand. If it seem good unto thee to come with me into Babylon, come. And I, look, I will look well unto thee, but if it seem ill unto thee to come with me into Babylon, forbear. Behold, all the land is before thee, whether it seem good and convenient for thee to go thither, go. And right here, it continues on, it says, Now while he, he was not yet gone back, he said, Go back also to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon hath made governor over all the cities of Judah. And we all know the story that, that Jeremiah agrees to just stay put. Uh, Jeremiah had the opportunity, though judgment even from a, a, a lost heathen man had now come and said, because of your wickedness, God has done this to you. And he said, I will be gracious unto you, come into my house, right? Obviously, even, even the heathen, he had good report unto them that were without, and they saw that the, that the preacher, there was nothing wrong with him. So he said, come with me, I'll take good care of you. But Jeremiah refuses, rather stays tight, stays where he's at, and, and it's just been announced that Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, has been, a, has been appointed, rather, governor over this area. He's been appointed governor, and though all the people were taken away, yet there is a remnant, and now they have this governor appointed over them. Look to Jeremiah chapter 41, verse 1 through 3. Jeremiah 41, now it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama, of the seed royal, and the princes of the king, even ten men with him, came unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, to Mizpah, and there they did eat bread together in Mizpah. And then arose Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the ten men that were with him, and smote Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam the son of Shaphan, with the sword, and slew him, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. Ishmael also slew all the Jews that were with him, even with Gedaliah at Mizpah, and the Chaldeans that were found there, and the men of war. So, these group, this group of men, was actually of the seed royal. In other words, they felt that they should be of the ruler. They felt that they should have been appointed governor. And yet, the ruler that had come in, Nebuchadnezzar, had, had wiped them out and appointed this government. But these took it upon themselves to just slay that ruler, right? The head, Nebuchadnezzar, was no longer present, but he still found opportunity. 
they still found opportunity to say, neither shall this man rule over us, right? They, they, said, they said, no, we are of the seed of well. We are the ones that ought to rule. And in, doing, and in order to promote themselves, they struck down that king. They struck down, sorry, the governor, right? The king is still sitting upon his throne many miles away. Now, if we would, look down to verse 11 in the same passage, Jeremiah chapter 41 and verse 11. But when Johanan, the son of Kareah, and all the captains of the forces that were with him heard of all the evil that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had done, then they took all the men and went to fight with Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and found him by the great waters that are in Gibeon. Now it came to pass that when all the people which were with Ishmael saw Johanan, the son of Kareah, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, then they were glad. So all the people that Ishmael had carried away captive from Mizpah cast about and returned and went unto Johanan, the son of Kareah. But Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, escaped from Johanan with eight men and went to the Ammonites. Then took Johanan, the son of Kareah, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, all the remnant of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, from Mizpah, after that he had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, even mighty men of war, and the women and the children and the eunuchs whom he had brought again from Gibeon. And they departed and dwelt in the habitation of Chibham. Chimam, which is by Bethlehem to go to enter into Egypt because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them because Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, whom the king of Babylon had made governor of the land. So this group now saw the wickedness that Ishmael had done in and, 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 and rebelling against the appointed leadership, and they decided to make of two wrongs a right in their mind, right? They went and they slew that group of people leaving none, and now it's, it's the second round of people who have appointed themselves rulers in this case. But these ones still are holding on to, if you notice, they are still retaining the fear of the first group because the Chaldeans, for they are afraid of them, right? So now they're standing, just as Lot did, gazing, aport, gazing towards Sodom, had his tent pitched there. This group is so afraid in this situation that they have their tent pitched towards Egypt and they have it pitched there because they were afraid of the Chaldeans. Yeah, they had exacted revenge upon the ones that had, had, had done against Babylon, but they are still fear in fear of the original um, insurrection, the original problem that had happened. You see how this, this fear seemed to, seemed to bottleneck and seemed to, to wind itself up and get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it just simply carries on. It doesn't, it doesn't come to an end until an end is put to it, I believe. And now in Jeremiah chapter 42, I'm just going to read through this passage and then we'll expound a little bit uh, verse by verse, best uh, we can by the grace of God. Chapter 42 of Jeremiah, Then all the captains of the forces, and Johanan the son of Kareah, and Jezaniah the son of Hoshiah, and all the people from the least even unto the greatest came near. And said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech thee, our supplication be accepted before thee, and pray for us unto the Lord thy God, even for all this remnant. For we are left but a few of many, as thine eyes do behold us, that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk, and the thing that we may do. Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words, as it shall come to, and it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be true and faithful witness between us, if we do not even according to all the things for which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God, to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. And it came to pass after ten days that the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah. And then called he Johanan, the son of Kareah, and all the captains of the forces which were with him, and all the people from the least even unto the greatest, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, 
the God of Israel, unto whom ye sent me to present your supplication before him. If ye will still abide in this land, then will I build you and not pull you down. And I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I repent me of the evil that I have done unto you. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom ye are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord. For I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. And I will show mercies unto you, that he may have mercy upon you and cause you to return into your own land. Return to your own land. But if ye say, we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no, but we will go into the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. And now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye remnant of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if ye wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt, and go to sojourn there, then it shall come to pass that the sword, which he feared, shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt. And the famine, whereof you are afraid, shall follow close after you in Egypt, and there ye shall die. So shall it be with all the men that set their faces to go into Egypt and to sojourn there. They shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, and none of them shall remain or escape from the evil that I will bring upon them. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as mine anger and my fury hath been poured forth upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so shall my fury be poured forth upon you, when ye shall enter into Egypt, and ye shall be an execration, an astonishment, and a curse, and a reproach, and ye shall see this place no more. The Lord hath said concerning you, O ye remnant of Judah, Go ye not into Egypt. Know certainly that I have admonished you this day. For ye dissembled in your hearts when ye sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us unto the Lord our God. And according to all that the Lord our God shall say, so declare us, so declare unto us, and we will do it. And now I have this day declared it to you, but ye have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, nor anything for the which he hath sent me unto you. Now therefore, nor certainly, that ye shall die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence, in the place where ye desire to go and to sojourn. So just in the reading of my, my, my regular Bible reading, I came upon this passage uh, sometime a few weeks ago, and I just, I just knew that this passage eventually I would have to come to. And I just want to walk through what God essentially spoke to me this morning about this in, in fashioning, you know, what we have here. First thing you see in, in Jeremiah chapter 42 and in verse 1. Then all the captains of the forces, and Johanan the son of Kerai, and, and Je Jeconiah, or Jez Jezaniah the son of Hoshiah, and all the people from the least even unto the greatest. This first verse talks about all the captains, very clearly, all the captains of the forces, and then it also highlights all the people. So we have the leaders here. We have that group of forces that went unto battle. We found that group of forces that did the second evil in order that good might come. And Jeremiah goes unto these people, but he brings... Actually, Jeremiah goes, returning from where he was captive, and finds them coming unto him. We find the captains, and we find all the people coming, seeking the prophet of God, seeking the man that had the word of God, seeking the man that would expound unto them what they needed to do. And they knew that the vehicle by which the prophet would get a hold of what was needed to do was through prayer. So they went, they came near unto Jeremiah the prophet, the preacher, the spiritual leader. And in verse 2, you see this. They said, Let we beseech thee, our supplication be accepted first before thee, and pray for us unto the Lord our God, even for all this remnant. They reach out to Jeremiah, the spiritual man, the, the leader of the spiritual uh, side of things. The man who had been preaching unto them all these years and telling them exactly what they needed to do. Finally, they reach out to him and said, pray for us. And they want to seek 
supplications and prayers unto God, and they need that man to go to God in order that he would bring down what is needed for them to do. They needed a, a media. They needed somebody to go and pray for them. This remnant, which is, is referred to as a few of many, they are leaders. They weren't the appointed leaders. No, they were the ones who had taken it by force. And I believe that these that are following are simply following out of, out of necessity. Quite often when, when someone rises up against against a, a, a leader, an appointed leader, or, or the leader that is in, in power at that time, uh, Brother Yuri would, would probably attest with me because that stuff goes on all the time over where he's from. There, there is quite often, it's not the multitude of people that rise up. We've seen it a few times in history, but usually it's a select few. It's a, it's a small one. It's, it's the leaders of the forces as we see here. And the rest of the people, the remnant, though there are few but many, I believe often have to just follow out of necessity. Sometimes I've heard stories from some of my friends where you wake up and tomorrow and in the morning suddenly your best friend, your neighbor, is now your enemy simply because a faction had change has taken place. Something has happened at the, at the heights of the leadership. Some sort of change has taken place whereby out of necessity now I find myself in this situation following a different type of people. I believe these groups were, were such. But regardless, the leaders went and out of necessity I believe the people, all the people, from the least unto the greatest, joined with them, seeking God through Jeremiah the prophet. And they, their request was simple. They wanted, as it says in verse 3, the prayer for us is that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk and the thing that we may do. It's simple. Uh, that only oh, God would lead the way. Oh, that God would show me exactly what to do. Jeremiah. Uh, would you go to God and pray that for us, that we can understand the way and follow it, that we can understand where God is leading and do it. And, and, and th this was the supplication that was made. Verse 4, we see, Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you, I have heard you, and, and many spiritual leaders love to hear this. Would you get a hold of God for me? That you could give me insight of what I need to do, of where I need to go. And, and, and spiritual leaders, as Jeremiah does here, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray it for you. I will pray to the Lord the God according to your words. Jeremiah hears this and he says, yes, absolutely, I've heard you. But what we need to understand is that even in this moment, we'll find out later, did they? The question rises, did they do this with sincerity and resolve? Though, though the leader's heart burns within him, he's like, yes, these people want to get hold of God. Yes, the leaders and the people that are following the leaders, they want God. And, and, and it's a great responsibility, but I've heard you. And I will pray for you, the preacher says, the prophet says. He says, yes, absolutely. And then he willingly accepts. As it says through verses 4 through 6, he says, I've heard you. I will pray for you. And it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. He's not going to mix words. He's not going to tell them something else other than what God had told him to tell them. I will keep nothing back from you, the prophet Jeremiah says. And out of a willing heart, he says, yes, absolutely, I've heard you and I will pray for you. In fact, maybe at this time, Jeremiah had a glimmer of hope. Though he'd been preaching and preaching and preaching and they've been, they've been saying, no, no, no. Perhaps at this time, he's like, finally, they have nothing left. Everything's been destroyed. There's this tiny remnant. The second faction of leadership that Nebuchadnezzar appointed has fallen. And, and, and maybe now the people are finally ready to hear what God has for them. Perhaps Jeremiah had just a little bit of hope. But we'll see. Did they do this with sincerity? Did they do this with resolve? Regardless of their motives, we see the preacher is ready. The preacher is willing. The preacher is able to get a hold of God and say, God, what would you have for these people? I'm so glad that they've reached out to you, out to you through me in this way. But we see very quickly that they make this oath that follows it. They make this oath that follows it. And quite often I think that this is the telltale sign that someone is not being sincere. Someone comes to you and they say, I didn't know what God means. Okay, great. Let, let's, let's find out what God wants. I didn't know what God wants me to do. Okay, yes, let's find out what God wants you to do. And then they say, whatever he says, I'll do it. Look what the people said here. Then they said unto Jeremiah, the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. Doesn't that seem like an abundance of pop and circumstance to come from this great amount of people? The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not even according to all the things which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Now, we've heard this before in the history of Israel, right? They made these, these great oaths of, 
Whatever the Lord says, we will do it. We see it in the time of Joshua. We see it in the time of Moses. We see it when the Ten Commandments were lifted up before them. And they said, of all the things we will do according to the word of the Lord. Of all of it. There, there's no wiggle room. They just say, yep, we're in. We're going to do it 100%. Many times the preacher just outright said to them, you've taken upon yourself a blessing and a curse. You, you, you cannot serve the Lord like God, Joshua said, right? You can't do it. Right? Nevertheless, according to your own sake, right? And the people continue on and they say, this, this great oration of, of their commitment to serving the Lord God, they say, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. They did have an understanding that if they're obedient, it would be well with them. The problem is they've probably plant uh, sown so much wicked fruit and they're going to spend a lot of time reaping reaping they've, they've sown bad seed they're going to spend a lot of time reaping crop fruit they're going to they're, they're not just going to do what god says this one time and it's going to be well with them but yet they make this great declaration yes we'll serve god whatever he says we'll do it this is our goal we want to do it biblically we want to do it scripturally we want to do exactly what the preacher says exactly what the word of god says we're in whether it's good or whether it's evil, our goal is obedience and nothing but. Just obey God, and we know it will be well with us when we do it. And that's verses 5 through 6. God will witness to us, they said, according to all the things. God shall send thee unto us. So they even have this understanding, and it says at the end of verse 5, that God shall send thee to us. They knew that they would be receiving the word of God by the preacher. And this was how, in the Old Testament, the word of the Lord would come to people. They had written scriptures, but I believe that it was so time-consuming to, to pen down the scriptures over and over that no one held it. Uh, you know, a Bible like we do this day, right? We just have one. There's probably a couple. Here's an extra Bible. I mean, this would be this would be the blessing beyond blessings if anyone had a scripture in their hand, even even a smidge of it, right? So when they needed to hear from God, God would send His men, and and God in many ways does the same thing today in the area of preaching. But how much more are we blessed, and how much more can we be expected of hearing the Word of God when we have it within our hands to behold each and every day when we wake up? What a blessing that is. But the end of the they understood, God shall send thee to us. In other words, we're waiting and God shall send thee. And whether it's good or whether it's evil, whatsoever God says, we will obey. And, and, and this is just how we're going to go forward. And it came to pass after ten days that the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, unto Jeremiah. So ten days later, the word of the Lord finally arrives. And my thinking way is that perhaps in this time, people started to wane, started to falter, started to doubt as they're waiting for the response to come. Even as when Moses went up to the mount, right? People, by the time they came back, they had this big, big queer pride like party or something going on. Everyone's naked. Everyone's celebrating. It's a rock show. It's like Woodstock all over again, right? In 1969. It's just, just wickedness and debauchery and fornication and idol worship and just like within 30 days. So it's not quite as extreme here, but 10 days have passed. And I believe that it was a little more dire straits there. They're just wandering in the wilderness in the time of, uh, of the Ten Commandments. But here, they're just waiting basically for Nebuchadnezzar to come and lob their heads off. So you don't think there was some fear? You don't think there was some doubt? Don't you think we can even say that, hey, maybe there was reason for the doubt and reason for the fear and reason for the people to, to wonder and to, and, to, and to maybe change their minds about whether or not they're going to fall through with what they just said? Who knows? But 10 days, I believe, is important to this passage. In fact, that's the main article of this verse 7. It's just that came to pass that after 10 days, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah. So we hear quite often the Bible, the word of the Lord came, the word of the Lord came, the word of the Lord came. We hear it came to pass. Those are kind of the, the, the bread. Those are the outside to the meat of this verse, I believe. 10 days. It's, it's highlighting something very important. 10 days, okay, in those dire straits. But after 10 days, then called he. So they came first, but then called he. Johanan, the son of Kariah, and all the captains of the forces which were with him, and all the people from the least, even unto the greatest. So we see here that after 10 days, the exact same meeting that happened in the first place happens. It said the exchange is different. There the people came to the man, the preacher. Here the preacher goes to them and says, God has spoken to me. It's time. It's time for me to tell you what God wants you to hear. And, and, and he begins to, after 10 days have passed. Now, I said before that I, I had wondered if maybe at that time was, 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 that was when some doubt entered into the people's hearts. But I think we're going to find out that that's not the case. But nevertheless, here is the message that he says. And he said unto them, 
Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto whom ye sent me to present your supplication before him. If ye will still abide in this land, then will I build you and not pull you down. And I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I repent me of the evil that I have done unto you. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon unto whom, of whom ye are afraid. Be not afraid of him. He says it twice. Saith the Lord, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. And I will show mercies unto you that ye may have mercy upon you, that he may have mercy upon you and cause you to return into your own land. So after this time has passed, this, this, this great message from God, after 10 days have passed, the great message that they were waiting to hear is that, is that it's, it's, it's the same as before. And it didn't change. So 10 days, God's like, they're like, God's going to go up. He's going he's gonna to get this great message. The guy's going to go up. He's going to get this great message from God. They're going to return. He's going to tell us what he wants us to do. And the command is this. If you will still abide in this land. If you will stay put. If you will stay in this land. And verse 11 says, be not afraid. Their command was the same command that had been going on for chapter upon chapter upon chapter upon chapter upon chapter upon chapter of the lives of these people. Stay where you're at. And, and, and I will build you. Stay where you're at and don't be afraid, right? And yet they've, they've, they've refused, right? So the same message comes down to them from above. And I understand that in the beginning, God said, God said, go, go, submit yourselves unto Babylon. Submit yourselves unto Babylon. But now, the, kind of the tables have turned. Babylon is coming, right? They're not going to be carried away to Babylon. Babylon's coming with the intent of lobbing some heads off, right? But he says, I will give you mercy through them. I will be merciful unto you by doing this. And all you have to do is don't be afraid and stay still. Don't be afraid and stay where you're at. Yeah. So now, still abide is the command. Still abide is what they were to do. He says, I will build you. He says, I will plant you. He says, here and now, despite what has happened before, despite the wickedness that you have done in overthrowing a ruler and overthrowing a ruler and disobeying me over and over and over and over and time and time again, Jeremiah goes up and seeks the God and says, what would you have for these people? They say, he says, stay where you're at. And he says, of whom you are afraid, be not afraid. Simple. Don't be afraid of them. Just stay where you're at is the command of God. He, he promises out of this situation salvation. He promises out of this situation deliverance. He promises out of this situation, even from a ruthless and wicked king whom they have crossed. Right? Whom they have rose up against unlawfully. He promises salvation, deliverance, and mercy if they would only obey. And their, their obedience is hinged upon staying where they're at and not being afraid. Just stay where you're at and don't be afraid. My anchor holds. Right? Don't move. Anchor. Put it down and, and just stay. Ride the waves. Right? Stay. Don't be afraid. Right? Why are you so fearful, Jesus said, when the, when the ship was moving, right? When the ship was wrong. Why are you so full of unbelief, right? This was constantly a battle in the Christian's life. Do we think it's different this day? No, but so much of the Christian life, I'll say it time and time again, and I'm still learning this, is to just stay put and don't be afraid. Stay where you're at and don't be afraid. Don't move. Still by, the Bible says. Verse 13, we see the contrary. But if you say, now look, he's still giving first the command, but now this is the contrary. Because Israel's, Israel's blessings and cursings were always hinged upon conditionals. If and but statements, if there's any programmers here. If he will, I will. But if not, I won't. Right? It's just, it's just this contrary, um, whether you're going to do what God says or whether you're not going to do what this says. And that's how God works. So he says here, but if ye say, we will not dwell in this land, neither obey we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, No, but we will go into the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, neither hunger of bread, and there we will dwell. So he just said, abide still, and, is, and, and the contrary is, if you will do this, if you will make this statement, if you will make this pronunciation, and it seems a little extreme to me, because the one is very like, okay, all we're doing, we're passive, we're sitting, we're waiting, we receive all these blessings, and then 
Jeremiah is prophesying here that there's going to be this extreme act of rebellion if they chose the other direction. They're saying, no, very firm, no, but we will. And then he says, and now in verse 15, now therefore hear the word of the Lord, you remnant of Judah. So now he's taken this hypothetical and he's made it personal. Hear ye the word of the Lord, you remnant of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if ye wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt and to sojourn there, then it shall come to pass that the sword, which ye fear, shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt. And the famine whereof you are afraid shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there ye shall die. With the contrast, he just said, I will give you blessings, I will give you mercy, I will deliver you, I will give you salvation if you shall still abide. I will build you, I will plant you. Be not afraid. And the contrary is here, is that if they will not, if they say no, if they're going to do it their way, if they have their own method, if they have their own path, if they have their own style, if they, if they just have their own minds made up that they are going to Egypt, whether they like it or not. Remember, Jeremiah found them facing Egypt already. They had gotten to Bethlehem. They were this close to entering into Egypt. Their face was firmly set. Where were they anchoring? Egypt. They were directed at Egypt. They were going to Egypt whether or not the preacher said something contrary, whether or not the word of God said something contrary, whether or not God came to them and said, this is what I want to do, their mind was made up. Amen. Well, no, we're just, we're just giving the commandments here. He's still just allowing them to choose. He's still just allowing them the option. No, the message here was still abide, be not afraid. The method, me message that the God had put forward was, wait on the Lord, he will build, he will plant. But now, I seems, now it seems they're even, they're even turning against the man. We'll cover this more later. Just, this is just the preacher admonishing them, and yet they say no. Why? No, because of fear. Fear of the Lord. Fear, or fear of the Lord bringeth knowledge. Fear of the Lord bringeth wisdom. But every time, fear of man bringeth snare, and fear of man bringeth sin. And so in verse 17 it says, So shall it be with all the men that set their faces to go into Egypt to sojourn there. They shall die by the sword, by the famine, by the pestilence. Again, all the things that they're fearing shall come upon them. For thus saith the Lord, verse 18, of hosts, the God of Israel, as my anger and my fury hath been poured forth upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Right? You guys witnessed this with your own eyes. You've already seen God's wrath happen upon the nation that you used to be a part of, which is dust and ashes. So shall my fury be poured forth upon you, when ye shall enter into Egypt. And you shall be an execration, an astonishment, a curse, a reproach. What does that mean? They should be a byword. In other words, they're going to show up where they had intended to go in the first place. What were they seeking? They were seeking no war. What were they seeking? They didn't want to hear the sound of a trumpet. What were they seeking? No hunger of bread. They wanted to dwell in that land according to their own will. They wanted to dwell in that land according to their plans that they had set forth, including the direction that they had. And yet he said, in the place where ye go, I will bring the curse with you. The curse that you think you have here and you're running from, the struggles that you think you have here and you're fleeing from, they're just going to follow you. And everything that you're afraid of and everything that you're fearing is going to be your end. This is what he's saying to the people. He's saying, what you're afraid of is going to be your end. And in verse 19, the Lord hath said concerning you, and he brings it down personal again, O ye remnant of Judah, go ye not into Egypt. How much clearer can he be? Still abide. Be not afraid. And now he's just going to make it really clear. He's going to bring the cookies down to the bottom drawer. He's going to bring it nice and easy for the people to understand. The Lord has said, go ye not into Egypt. Know certainly that I have a mind you this day. And this is where I say they rejected the man. Jeremiah simply is saying, the Lord hath said, thus saith the Lord. You asked me to go to prayer for you unto God. God has said, go ye not into Egypt. And I'm just standing here saying, no, certainly I have a you. Jeremiah is saying, I have taken the word of God and held it before you, and I am just admonishing you to do what the word of God says. That was the responsibility of the preacher. That was the responsibility of the prophet in this situation. It's no different today. right? So don't get mad at the preacher when he says something that you don't like to hear. Why? Because he is taking the word of God and simply admonishing you to be obedient unto it. Jeremiah did the exact same thing here. Now here's where I, I believe it, the, the true situation comes to pass. Because we said 
said that perhaps maybe Jeremiah's heart was warmed when the people came and sought him. When the people came and said, would you pray to God for us? We need to know where to go. We need to know what to do. And the preacher says, yes, absolutely, I will. Spends 10 days with God. 10 days in prayer. Man, we struggle to have 10 minutes of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. Who's there, right? Who's there each and every day? Sweet hour of prayer. Oh, what's a God? We could find a sweet hour of prayer to be with God. Amen. But Jeremiah spends 10 days with the Lord. 10 days with the Lord seeking him. Do you, think, do you think he wanted to believe the worst of the people? Do you think he thought, oh, these people are just wrong? No, he took that group that had murdered their leader, who had murdered their leader, who had said no, 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 to all his preaching previous. And with, with a true and sincere heart, he goes up to God for 10 days and says, what? What should these people do? What would you have me to preach unto them? What would you, what can I say that could help them? What can I say that could allow you, if they're obedient, to build them, to plant them, to save them, to deliver them? God, help me help them, is a simple cry. But they dissembled. Here it is. For ye dissembled, verse 20, ye dissembled. You put on a false appearance. You hid under the cloak of maliciousness. You're concealing facts and intents. You dissembled in your hearts when you sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, pray for us unto the Lord our God, and according to all that the Lord our God shall say, so declare unto us, and we will do it. They dissembled. In other words, way back there in verses 5 through 6, when they made that great oration, that's why I said quite often when people are making these great promises, but all the things that they want to do in the kingdom of God, about all these things that they want to be in the kingdom of God, about all these great works and exploits, and all these great things that they want to do, and God would just tell them what is His will. Just tell them what He wants. Just tell them the way. Just tell Him the thing that we must do. These people make great orations, and look, the, the, the promise the prophet here expounds to exactly what was in their heart. They were dissemblers. They put on that full appearance. They, they, they hid under that cloak. They were concealing the facts and intents. But we know that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It is a discerner of the dissimulation. The word of God that Jeremiah heard, no doubt by the time he had received it, by the time he had understood what he was to preach out of the people, the Bible itself, the Word of God itself, God speaking through him and to him, had said, these people are dissemblers. These people are rejecting the Word and the God, and, 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 and they will reject the Word. And they will continue to reject the Word. Why? Because they have, they have their own image of what the message should be. They have their own understanding of what the method should be. And they have their own understanding of what the men should say. And, 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 it's, and it's emphasized there when we look at verse 43, or chapter 43, it says, And it shall come to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking, all the people, all the words, look at that, all the people, all the words of the Lord, of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent unto them, even all these words, right? Then spake Azariah, the son of Hoshiah, and, and Johanan, the son of Kiriah. So they're going to make their response now. And all the proud men sang unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. So we see that their heart of dissimulation, their heart of having their own intent, their mind was already made up, and the only thing that they have to respond to, notice, they had in their minds what the message should be, but they didn't attack the message. They had in their minds what the method should be, right? But they didn't attack the methods. They attacked the man and they said, God didn't send you. God didn't send you. This wasn't the word of God. You're, you're, you're lying to us, Jeremiah. And they're all, they're all working. They're all concealing. They're all, as leaders, they have behind the scenes decided what they're going to do. They're going to follow through with their plan. And they're just going to say, hey, that man wasn't sent to preach those words. Those words are not of God. Now notice, 4 in verse 24, ye dissembled. In your hearts. Verse 21. Ye have not obeyed. Jeremiah saw because of the word of God that he had received. He saw the intents of their hearts. And so when he came and he delivered the message. He already had an understanding of how the people would react. God had already given him an understanding of how the people react. And yes there are tells. 
right? Remember they pitched their tents towards, uh, or they, they moved towards Egypt, right? They were standing on the border where, where Bethlehem is to go and to enter into Egypt. So you can tell when somebody has a direction, a direction that they're going to go, and they're sort of starting to lean there. there there's, there's a tell that many people on the outside can see and many people on the outside can know, right? The same example is Lot, Lot pitching his tent towards Sodom. But I believe that there is, there is a special sight, a special foresight, a special revelation to those that, that, that will get in the Word. The Word of God is going to give you an understanding of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so when Abraham saw Lot pitch towards Sodom, he said, you know what? Pick. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. Are you going to go to the well-watered plains, or are you going to go to the desert places which God has promised you? And they said, we're going to the well-watered plains. Why the same reason that they have here? We don't want to see any war. We don't want to hear the sound of the trumpet. We don't want hunger or bread. Lot chose that direction. Abraham already knew what he was going to choose. In the same way, Jeremiah now hears the word of God preached unto him after 10 days of seeking God. I believe Jeremiah was probably saying, oh, is there another way? Lord, can you help them? Lord, can you bless them? Can you give them the strength? Can you give them the result? Can you have them choose you? Can you have them say, yes, my heart as a preacher, my heart as a leader of these people is that they would do your will and they would be blessed in it. That's all I want, God. Ten days he seeks them and yet they say, no. And it was revealed through the word of God in that back and forth with God for ten days, in that time of prayer, in the time of hearing of the words of God, the thoughts and intents of their heart, and the thoughts and intents of their heart was that they were never going to follow God to begin with. They had it made up. They had their mind made up. They had their understanding already sure. And so they continued in that. They weren't going to change. Verse 21, And now I have this day declared unto you. Plain as day, Jeremiah says, I have declared it. You said you would do it. And I said my part would be that I would declare whatever God says. And I have this day declared it to you, but ye have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, nor anything for the which he hath sent me unto you. Now therefore, nor certainly that ye shall die. He's, he's, he's not saying some prediction that he come up with of his own heart. He's not saying that he thinks this is how it's going to pan out. He's saying for of a certainty because he had heard it preached in the word of God. He had heard it from God himself. He had heard it in the reading and the hearing of God's words. And right, he gave it to them exactly how they, how the Lord delivered it. Now therefore, know certainly ye shall die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence, in the place where ye desire, ye desire, ye desire to go, in the place where ye desire to go and to sojourn. That is where you will die. All your fears will come, will come upon you. It's a, it's, a, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. If we turn from his way, if we turn from his plan, if we turn from his His very words, we will find ourselves, for they were afraid. Yes, these people were afraid. They're, we can fix that. We can recover from that. But they refused. They took that fear and they turned that into self-will and self-motivation. And that fear became the driving determinant factor in which they were going to make their next steps. And that which they feared in the end, that which they were most afraid of, that which they had, had concern of, that which they dreaded, came upon them. And the prophet prophesied so. Thank you, Father, for this day. I think